introduce uh, Nils Davis. Uh, Nils, if you don't know him by day, is a senior PM at Trinet, but he's also a well-known author of the Secret Product Manager's Handbook, uh, product speaker, product coach, and the host of the Secrets of Product Management, which of course you'll see right over here where his <laughs> uh, his uh, background is. Uh, which is a great, fantastic podcast that explores mental models, tools, techniques, and secrets for product managers, product marketers, innovators, and founders. Nils has a ton of experience to share on product, and I'm really excited to have him here today to share some well-grounded and also provocative opinions and thoughts on all things roadmaps. Welcome, Nils. Thank you for having me on, Scott. I'm really no, looking forward to it. No problem. And again, like I, I don't want to treat this too much like a fireside chat with me today, but I'm going to get some things started here as we kind of wait for some of the questions to come in from our audience um, but maybe you can tell us just a little bit about you, Nils. Like, how'd you get into product? Tell us a little bit about your, your journey into this. Well, like a lot of folks, it was an accident that I got into product. I had no idea what to do when I got out of college. I was a math major. A friend of mine from college who I'd actually, she, somebody I'd met in college, she went to the same college as I, she said, oh, you would make a good tech writer for this project I'm working on. So I started in high tech as a tech writer. Yep. And um, then... I joined a company called IntelliCorp and I was a tech writer there for a few years and the product manager of that company left. Nobody knew what he did anyway. And they said, oh, you should be, you should be the product manager. I, and I have no idea what their criteria were for saying this to me, but <laughs> I took on the job. And of course, nobody in those days knew what product management even was. There were no books. And so I just kind of did product. I did stuff like tried to explain what our product did to customers and make sure that sales were selling the things that we thought we could do and things like that. And one of the reasons I call my book, the secret product manager handbook is because back in those days, I always thought there must be some secret handbook that people have to do this job because nobody, nobody knows how to do it. So and that was a, quite a long time ago. At this point, there's obviously a lot more knowledge about how to become a product manager. So, and then I've been doing it. Oh, so the other really important thing in my background is that, so I did get some good examples of product managers. I, I eventually worked with a guy who was incredible at product management in the sense of he figured out how to create a product that was really, really successful. And then after that, I worked for a company that had a product for product managers called Accept360, which was mm. a tool for managing product management. It was, it was, it was much like product board, actually a lot of the similarities that company, unfortunately didn't succeed. And I made it my goal after that to try to figure out, well, why not? It was a product that was, there was definitely was a need for it. You know, product managers suffer from not having tools and we all know it and we all use other people's tools and it's not very good. And there's nothing that really understands product management, certainly in those days. And so I wanted to figure out what went wrong there. And I have, and that's a lot of what I put my effort in since then. That's that was around 2011. So since then, a lot of it has been, well, what, makes it how do you make a product successful how do you how do you create a product that has the op, the potential to be successful and then if you've created it and you can't sell it but it should be successful what do you what can you do things like that so go to market has become a big part of what i think about a lot yeah 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 definitely definitely um we've spoken previously about product roadmaps and the importance of thinking about a roadmap as a sketch rather than like a clean, shiny AAA map that we kind of pull out of our glove box when we're trying to go to our destination. Yeah. Um, how much of that, our roadmap problems are really because we frame up the roadmap both internally and externally as this kind of polished asset? Well, it, a lot of it is because of that. So, you know, if you think about the roadmap as a metaphor, you know, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember paper folding maps that you'd get at the gas station or something. And, um, you know, they, if you charted out a, a route on that map and said, well, I want to get from, you know, San Francisco to Los Angeles, those roads would all exist. You could drive the, the freeway speeds on all of them, all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> of course, a product roadmap, a roadmap of the future of our product is, first of all, it's predicting the future, which means that there's tons and tons of uncertainty. And we don't know what all the roads are, and we don't know which of those roads are paved and which ones are are, have which ones which bridges have washed out i mean we may know we may know we may have done something like what we're planning to do in a previous product but maybe the things that we used for that are no longer available or they don't work anymore or they don't work the same way or the way that the customers expect something to work you yeah. know if you tried to drive if you if you said i'm going to drive from san francisco to la today right today you can do that in five hours but what if 
as you drove, you found out, oh, I can only take the roads that were existing in 1940, right? That takes you two days. So the, this whole aspect of predicting the future in the roadmap is a big challenge because we just, there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. So that's why, a, that's why a sketch is more, I think, a better metaphor, right? It says, here's the things we think are going to happen. Here's some things we don't. There's uncertainty around. Of course, typically the people we're presenting to don't want to hear about that. And that's a whole yeah. separate challenge, but. Yeah, definitely. So like with, with that kind of a sketch kind of idea in mind, like what does a roadmap look like at Trinet for you? Like how do you, what, <clears throat> what does your sketch look like? Or is it right, a sketch? Well, at, at, <laughs> at Trinet, you know, like a lot of big companies, we 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 try to give a sense of where we're going, you know, in the, in the roadmap. And it's, I, th I think at Trinet, it's, it's a lot like, any big company you know there's there's a lot of roadmaps it's one person's there's a group that's actually their job is to is to create a over an um <clears throat> a consolidation of all the roadmaps that all the individual teams work on and it's a it's a constant ongoing challenge and it does involve a lot of predicting the future so we have to be careful about how we do that um you know one of the things that makes working on a roadmap a lot easier is if you have a good product strategy so mm -hmm. you can say, we're doing these things and here's why, right? Um, and we do have a, a decent product strategy at Trinet so we can align things with the goals of the company that are not just product goals, but actually company goals. And so we do a lot of that, but there's also, you know, even at a place like Trinet, and I've seen this everywhere, there's a hippo that comes in and says, we, sh you need, to, we need to do this right now, right? And I've, that's a really dangerous situation so you can the product team can spend a lot of time on a roadmap and then the sudden things comes in from left field doesn't necessarily hasn't really necessarily been fully validated mm -hmm. that happens a lot and you end up everybody you know ch you know marches to the left to to make this thing ch happen this change happen and eventually it isn't worth having been it's not worth having done that's happened you know that happens all the time and so that's, you know, it's an, it's an interesting combination of there's this demand for visibility into what we're going to be doing. And then there's this willingness to just say, oh, forget about all that, do this other thing. Yep. And that's a, that's a challenge in every company. Um, and it's one of the reasons I think of roadmaps as being problematic is that, you know, there's often a sense of, oh, you can just add this thing in, this thing out of left field, but you're still going to do that other stuff, right? or you still will do that other stuff. And it's not a question. It's a, it's a statement. And of course, no, we can't do that anymore. Cause you, cause everything got derailed. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of assumption that uh, it, it's, I guess, both a sketch as well as a very malle malleable sketch. Right. Right. Yeah. And this is this, and there's always that thing that the, the thing that comes in, it's, Oh, this will be easy. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So we're gonna jump into, I guess, maybe some of the first questions we're getting here. Uh, uh, first one is I'm 100% aligned to the headline of this chat. Roadmaps are not for communication. Roadmaps are for persuasion and influence. My colleagues in sales and marketing, CS, and my executives are not. How have you built enthusiasm for this approach with real decision makers? <laughs> Ooh, well, that's a tough one. That is a very tough one. And and the reality is it's not that easy to do that. The But irrespective of whether they think that's mm -hmm. what it's for, that is what, you're, what you should make as your goal, right? You need to understand, well, what am I trying to achieve with this roadmap? Do I, what do I want if I'm presenting it to customers? What do I want the customer to think after I've presented the roadmap? Now, I think the ideal situation with the customer is for the product manager to go in with a roadmap of a, a slide or whatever it might be, and then start a conversation and you never get to the roadmap slide because you're having a good conversation about how you as a company and you as a product and you as a leader are doing the things that the, that the prospect or the customer needs without mm -hmm. having to show them the roadmap. That's, that to yes. me is the ideal conversation, right? Um, and, and if you then say, okay, well, how do I make a slide or a roadmap picture, you know, a graphical representation of our product plans? How do I make a picture that aligns with that? Well, depending on the customer that might have different things on it, right? Because they might not be interested in some of the things you're working on. I've made roadmaps where I literally have made road roadmaps where 
the feature that the customer I was talking to wasn't on there, even though we were working on it, because I wanted to, them to come away from the meeting understanding that they were not our only customer and they were not our, and that even though they were important to us, we had other customers that were, that we were prioritizing work for. Now, this was a risky move, of course. It did work, but it's a type of thing that, you know, sometimes you you don't show the things that you're working on, even for the person that's interested, because you may have a different purpose. Um, and so, you know, typically, that's an unusual situation, but I have done that. But typically, if you're going to be presenting to a customer, you're not going to tell them about things they're not interested in, or you might give yeah. it briefly. And then, and when I'm talking to a customer, I don't want to say, well, you're going to get this in February, you know, 2023. I'm going to say, we're working on this to deliver in the first half or next year. Because again, we don't know what other things are going to come in and disrupt. And so I don't want to set expectations because that ends up with everybody being unhappy. So those are some of the things that, that for me, particularly when I'm talking to outsiders yeah. and outsiders can be anybody who's not like my team, you know, in, in reality, but particularly for customers and prospects, I don't want to set expectations that I can't hundred percent guarantee. And it's the future. So I can't for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I want to dive just a little bit deeper into that question. Cause I think the sure. two pieces I'm really like, sort of honing in on here, maybe perhaps again, I'm proof I'm reading just through a Q and a, so it may not be the case, but, but essentially the persuasion and influence parts of this, maybe right. how can we be better at the persuasion with our roadmap and the influence with our roadmap? Sure. So the, there's a couple of things that I think about in terms of persuasion and influence. And, and one, if you think about one reason that executives like roadmaps is they like to feel that that dev they like to have some evidence that dev is not just a black box and that it's not a bunch of malingerers just sitting around twiddling their thumbs and we're actually coding and and that we're also not idiots so we're not just building the things we want to build versus what is needed for the business now it really helps if there's a strategy right <laughs> because mm -hmm. where the business said here's what we need and they have a rationale behind the strategy and and some some idea of how to achieve it and then we can show that we're building things that are related to that so that's that's always useful but in the absence of that or even in the presence of that i think the the some of the things you want to achieve in the roadmap in addition to saying here's what we're working on is to be able to justify why you're working on those things it's not like oh we're going to build this widget it's we're building this widget because we've talked to 100 customers and they all have this challenge and it's very important to them. And if we want to keep them as customers, we need to address the challenge. And we're doing that via this widget, right? So you always put it in that context. So that's that's one level of raising the persuasion, this persuasion and influence piece is to say, is to justify the things that are on there. Now, you can, of course, do this by aligning it to the strategy as well. And then that, all, that but that also does some things for you, right? It shows that, oh, you're not just making this up out of thin air. It's not just your opinion. You have data. You have evidence behind the decision to do this. Um, you often can say, here's why we're doing this instead of this, which shows that you have considered options. Now, one thing about a roadmap is it doesn't, you can't really show the things you're not doing on the roadmap, but you can talk about it when you, pre when you present the roadmap. Um, another thing you can do with your roadmap is to help use your persuasive skills is to say we're doing this first instead of this other thing and here's why right so you to me you always want to have all of that the reasoning behind what's going on on the roadmap and it needs to not just be your opinion but it needs to be um based on on data and then the other piece on on the persuasion piece is to be very careful about what you're actually committing to because when you put something on a roadmap it kind of becomes a commitment in people's heads, even though you know perfectly well that there's a huge amount of uncertainty and everybody rationally knows there's uncertainty. People's subconscious brain just immediately turn them into commitments. So you need to be careful about what you put on to the roadmap in terms of the words and the the boxes and the way it's presented, right? So so I, I would never put a feature name on a roadmap unless I was mm -hmm. gonna deliver that next week or something, right? I might put, here's the the outcome that's related to that feature and here's 
a longer time than I actually think I'm going to deliver it in. And it's in, it's in purple, you know, so that looks not as, not as black, not it's, so it's literally not black and white, you know, something like yeah. that. Um, so I think those are all the types of things that, so it's a combination of you can be perceived as more persuasive if you do this right. Plus which you're using your persuasive tools, your tools of persuasion to make sure you don't get boxed in or you don't give the wrong message. You don't set expectations incorrectly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much is in the execution delivery of that message as much as essentially the asset itself. You know, That's right. That way. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, one of the things you can't, you can't do that very well. If you just, if somebody says, well, send me the roadmap. Because if you don't, if you can't put the gloss around the roadmap, that's, it's really dangerous. And so that makes it yeah. even more important. You then have to say, well, I'm going to abstract myself from that into the roadmap. How can I make this roadmap reflect my goals, which are, are yeah. to, you know, set expectations correctly and things like that. Yeah, we got a cool new feature for that uh, that we released recently. It allows you to record a Loom video at the roadmap when you send it. So actually people can see you present it essentially, even though you're not there, which helps you convey essentially the information oh, exactly. around the roadmap, I mean, which is yeah. great. Perfect. That sounds um, that sounds awesome. Jump another question here from Sarah. Um, what advice would you give to a newer product manager that's struggling to identify innovative and future ideas? Uh, so good question. Not really a roadmap question per se, but you can you can use some of the ideas from that we've just talked about to to think about this one of them is of course if you have a strategy if you have a product strategy you're looking for ideas around that strategy so th the best way to get product ideas is to talk to customers and prospects about where their struggles are and that's a whole set of skills you know but you can learn them and they're not they're not that hard the hardest part about doing them is do, doing it is doing it right it, once you get in for me anyway setting up the appointment with somebody is the hardest part once i'm talking to someone it's fine you know i, can, I have yeah. all the questions i want to ask but you know that's really the whole domain of market discovery and what i would say is don't try to don't try to think up these ideas on your own at minimum if you are don't have access to customers you need to put yourself in the customer's shoes and think like a customer or a prospect or somebody who's not a customer <clears throat> because your ideas aren't worth much. The customer's ideas are the ones, uh, not even their ideas. Their ideas aren't worth much either. <laughs> their problems are worth something. Their yeah. ideas might worth be worth something because they give you a place to start asking about what is the problem behind that idea. But you know, the, um, you know, what you want to do when you put yourself in your, in your customer's shoes or your prospect's shoes is to, is to not say, what's a if i was this customer what would my idea be <clears throat> it would be if i was this customer what would i be struggling with either with the product as it is today or something that i can't i would I, i'm struggling with and it's adjacent to what the product does today those are what you're looking for yeah no, that's great it's a good answer um i'm gonna jump up with another question here of like what are some of the biggest misconceptions you think pms have about product roadmaps that it's just a list of the features you're building. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the number one misconception. I mean, particularly for people that are that come to product management out of engineering, right? Where yeah. what they know of is, I mean, and I'm obviously this is a overly simplified view of what people coming into product management from engineering are like, but they are really familiar with this list of features. They knew about the list of features that they were working on when they were engineers, and so they think, well. I, I'm, I need to tell people what I'm working on or what we're working on as a team. And, and there's an aspect potentially to, I'm the product manager. I'm the smartest person in the room, which is often true, of course. Um, and so you will all obviously be interested in this information that I have to tell you. And that, and what the information that I really have is here's what we're working on. Well, that's, that is a roadmap, but it is it does all the wrong, all th it does a bunch of things you don't want it to do, right? It yeah. commits you to details that you don't want to be committed to. In my opinion, it doesn't take it up a level to the strategy level. Like, like I never want my sales team to know about features that I'm building. I want them to be able to tell the story of, oh, this problem that you're solving, that you're facing, Mr. Or Mr. Ms. Customer, we have a solution to that coming out. 
I don't want them to talk about the future. I want them yeah. to talk about the problem and the fact that we understand their problem and that we're building something to solve that problem for them. And I, I don't want them to get into any more detail than that. You know, so that's the, that's a danger. Putting what you're building on the roadmap is a is a mistake. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay, that's good. That's good. Any other misconceptions that sort of come up on that? You just kind of see <clears throat> uh, that there is one roadmap. That there is a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so you probably you've heard me talk about. Well, I create roadmaps for individual customers. You know, or I or individual stakeholders. Like I'm going to not present the same thing to the product leadership team as I am to mm -hmm. the business leadership as I am to the sales leadership as I am to the sales organization. So all of those are different. They're, they're obviously related. <laughs> you know, I don't want one that says something totally different than the, another one, but they, but they're going to have different levels of detail. The conversation around them is going to be different. Um, you know, one might be multiple pages, one might be one half of a page or one slide, you know? Yep. And sometimes we won't get to the slide. That's, as I say, that's my favorite thing. <laughs> that's when we don't even get to the slide. Because at that point, you're just, you're, you are, your persuasion and influence skills are such that they trust you, which is what your goal is. And it should be what your ethos is anyways, to be a trustworthy representative of what's going on. And they feel like, oh, you don't need to tell me anything, any more detail. I trust you to make the right decisions. And as these, as you deliver things, you're going to help me understand how to take them to market, how to sell them, how they're going to impact me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, what are the disadvantages to using roadmaps to communicate internally? It's an interesting question. Same, same challenge, um, you know, and it depends on who you're communicating to, right? Because again, you have different stakeholders, you have your team. So, you know, if you think about Scrum or any agile methodology, right? you're pretty confident what you need to deliver this sprint and the next sprint. The whole point of Agile is that you aren't that confident about what you need to deliver three or four sprints down the road. You think you know, but anything could change and cause that to change, right? So there's a risk. If you say, here's the things we're going to be working on over the next six months, knowing that the whole point of your methodology is to be able to respond to change and you know that change will happen, well, that roadmap is probably misleading. And for people that are the type of people that in, engage with that, with that roadmap that's six months long, they're going to have a problem. <laughs> you know, they're going to say, wait, you told us we we're going to be working on this thing. And I got all my mental gears all in, in shape for that. And now we're doing something else. That's very frustrating to me. So that's just like, that's, that's the local roadmap. That's the roadmap for the team. And even there you have challenges if you get too, too explicit. So, and again, as I say, like, I don't tell salespeople features that we're building. I say, sort of outcome related things that were or themes that we're working on i don't give them yeah. i i typically will sandbag dates because the chances of us missing a date are much better generally than us making a date you know even if i mean you know if you think about estimates <laughs> estimates are all, almost always wrong and they're almost never wrong in the direction that we'd want them to be wrong yeah. Right? And it's never like, oh, this is going to take us three months and, oh, it only took us a month. That never happens. It's just going to take us three months, but, oh, it took us five months. So why would I try to pretend like that's not reality, right? The, the And because of the math major, I like to think about this from a mathy perspective a little bit, which is think about the distribution of estimates related to actuals, right? Is it a normal distribution? No, it is not because the estimates are almost always longer, they almost always shorter than the actuals. That's not a normal distribution. It's a different kind of distribution. And it could be arbitrarily longer because you may end up never doing it. You may do it and it may fail and you may have to do it again and again before you get it right. So, um, you know, don't go into this pretending that, oh, well, this is a normal distribution. And I can just put something sort of in the middle of the estimate and that'll cover the time. No, it won't. You'll never beat the, the estimate. 99% of the time you won't beat the estimate. Usually you will miss the estimate. And so yeah. be really careful about that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it gets worse and worse. The further away from your team, you're presenting that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's interesting. Like, I mean, I'll come back to like, I know Todd Lombardo 
you know, described roadmaps as like a strategic communication tool, a statement of intent and direction in terms of how you'll realize your product vision. And that it contained essentially the vision, the outcomes, and the themes comprised of problems, needs, and objectives. Nice. And, and I think that was a great statement essentially that sort of described what I think a roadmap is. But I think maybe what we get caught in is this sense of the time scale. Um, and yep. that sort of, you know, that axis, I think, is what sort of what plagues us as product managers a little bit in terms of like being able to communicate at least our intent and direction, but and and trying to give some confidence about the when because everybody needs to know when in some way, but at the same time, not being able to do that and dealing with the consequences of that decision. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. And I, I love that description that Ty has. I think it, it captures what I think makes a good roadmap is this intention, how it's aligned with what we want, mm -hmm. what we want to do in the market. Um, that it's based on outcomes as opposed to the things we're actually building, that it's focused on the customer problems rather than on, on what our responses to those problems are. I think those are all fantastic. And yeah, the time problem. So, you know, there's this now next later concept of a road of roadmaps, which is obviously irrespective of however else you feel way better from the standpoint of expectation setting than mm -hmm. a date-based roadmap. Yep. Um, you know, the, the tension is that a lot of people want a date-based roadmap. And so how do you, you know, you have to, you have to manage everybody into the state, into the place where they're ready for a now next later type of roadmap as opposed yeah. to. Um, yeah. We find like date-based roadmaps come in really well when we're confident about the date. Sure. Um, well, you know, as our confidence increases over time, we become more confident about our ability to hit that date. Now we start talking about dates. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, that sort of now next later structure is very flexible as you talked about and, and giving us at least a statement of intention, intended direction and momentum totally. that we're going to get. Totally. Um, yeah, definitely on that side. Yeah. Um, there's I'm... a question here, like, you know, sort of about, uh, you know, this person hates sharing the roadmap because customers and internal stakeholders keep them to their time scales. Um, right. And, and, you know, as you say, how do you predict the future when you don't know how to predict the future? I mean, is, is this now next later or some other type of format, essentially a better way to anchor that? Or is that really, again, I, how you frame I, I up think that if, conversation? If Well, so it's a combination of things. One yeah. is, you know, we don't have a lot of certainty about things that are far away. And if you put it on the roadmap on a date, it looks like you do. And, and you know, the reality is like at Trinet, there are some things that we have to do by certain dates because there's regulatory things and there's you yep. know, benefit renewal things. So there's certain things that we have to do by certain dates. So, and those we put on the roadmap, but you know, there's certain, but there's a lot of stuff. We don't know when it's, we don't really know when it's going to happen. We may think we know, but we don't. And so, you know, the best practice there to the degree that you can avoid it is to not put dates on those things is to, but so now next later is something you can use. One thing that I, um, so that would be my first sort of answer to this person, right? Try, let's try to see if you can formulate this as now, next, later. I would also say definitely if you're putting features on the roadmap, take it up a level and talk about the outcomes those features are meant to provide. Um, I would also be very careful to make sure that the things you have on your roadmap are aligned. I, so I, I do think there's this whole issue of the executive leaders want to see a roadmap because they don't feel they're you're trustworthy i, I just there just is that aspect mm -hmm. to it and so the more you can build trust by showing that you're aligned with them at a business level the better and the less detailed the roadmap has to be at that point um and, and there's a lot of benefits to not having a detailed roadmap when you're talking to people outside of the tech team anyway first of all uh, i mean certainly you don't want to have feature names on there because i don't know if you have this problem in, at product board, but we I've always had this problem every place I work. I'll write a requirement. It'll, I'll give it a name. And then by the time we deliver it, the name is still accurate, but not fully accurate. Yeah. It's got jargon in it. You know, nothing I want a customer to see. Um, you know, we have all these technical terms within Trinet, like every company that customers have never heard before. Yeah. And we're already and, angry. And, and, <laughs> and we don't even want the salespeople to know these terms generally. Yeah. Right. And yet that's our features have those words in them. Well, I don't want to share that with sales or customers. And I really don't want to share them with execs either because they don't really care about those technical. They shouldn't be caring about that technical stuff. I mean, part of it is they should be trusting us to be doing the right thing. 
And the way that we show that we're doing the right thing is we say, we show them a roadmap, but the roadmap is aligned to the strategy. And it's very clear that we understand what that alignment is and how the strategy drove our decisions about what goes on there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my answer to that. And this yeah. isn't, this isn't easy. <laughs> it took me a long time to, to figure out how to do this effectively. Yeah. Okay. So how do you help that sales team transition to presenting the problems you're solving for them versus maybe the features you're delivering? Well, never give them a roadmap with features on them is the first step. So they don't have something to start. Yeah. And my feeling is that that a lot of most of your conversation with the with sales should be on problems, the problems the customer is facing, the the ways that our products helps people solve those problems. So that's but that's today. Those are features today. I'm very I'm happy to talk about features that we have mm -hmm. today. Um, how customers like that customer, that prospect solved the problem with our stuff. And sometimes that's just a, a matter of, oh, you're concerned about this feature that you don't, that we don't have. Well, let me tell you about a customer that is very happy with us. They wanted that feature. They chose us anyway, and now they're super happy, right? So objection handling. Well, you may not even have to then show that prospect that solution, maybe depending on how trustworthy you are as a person presenting. Um, or you may show them in a demo or something like that. But again, that's not, that's not roadmap stuff. That's not, that's stuff that exists. It's not future stuff. Um, if you're talking about, if you're talking to a prospect that's saying, well, I can't buy you because you don't do X and, and X is on the roadmap, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, something we're working on. I think at that point, the responsible salesperson calls in product management to have a conversation because that's a great opportunity for the product manager to do a little more discovery, to do a little more validation of what's going on, to explain what our approach to the solution is, not to say what the feature is, but to say, here's the things, you know, here's what our understanding of this problem, does that align with, you know, um, it's still dangerous to do that, but uh, putting, trying to, trying to close a prospect with a feature that doesn't yet exist this is a known fatal error, <laughs> right? M many companies have failed, literally failed on that, right? If it's an individual customer, an individual sale, and you're highly confident, then maybe it's okay, but it's super risky. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so basically uh, never never show a prospect a roadmap is, is the bottom line. Yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. Um, a question here from David Pincus. Uh, it sounds like you're saying put problems on the roadmap and not features. But I'm struggling to see how you can have productive conversations with stakeholders when they're going to want to know and have a right to know how you're going to solve those problems. Well, you can certainly have a conversation about how you're going to solve it, but is one line on a roadmap going to explain that? No. You know, so you can say, we know that um, that customers have a challenge with that that customers need to have more visibility into some report. Some it's, it's essentially the solution is a report. Right, we're going to deliver a report. Well, why do why why did we decide to build this report? Well, customers are having a problem with visibility into something, which makes it hard for them to do something. So we say, we're going to address this issue, this this challenge that customers have. That's what goes on the roadmap. You know, some some, some kind of wording, and that obviously, that's some wordsmithing. You only get two or three words anyway. You can't tell the whole story, right? And then somebody says, okay, well, why is this on the roadmap? And you then you have the conversation. Hundreds of our customers are have been complaining about this challenge. And this is the way that this is this. So we prioritize that challenge. And let me tell you about how we're going to solve it. And that's certainly a legitimate conversation, but it doesn't belong on the roadmap because it's too detailed and it needs caveats and it needs a, a narrative around it. So, um, yeah, I mean, this also goes back to this thing I was talking about, you know, where our feature names generally don't tell the story of yeah. what it actually does. And so if you, you know, it's like, I always use this example. If you, it's not exactly a roadmap example, but it's sort of, it, but it, it sort of illustrates the issue. If you tell salespeople, you, it, let's say you have a project management tool. If you tell salespeople, we have a project management tool. Well, they start selling against Microsoft Project because that's the biggest project management tool. Or they might start selling about against that big Oracle one, Primavera. Well, 
if your project management tools for SMBs that have a thousand projects and a hundred project project managers, well, Microsoft Project is not the competitor. Primavera is not the competitor. Mm -hmm. There's other competitors. And the stories you need to tell are different than you would tell to either of those other things. But if you only say to them, oh, project management capabilities, they're going to not, that's not going to help them. And so what would I be putting on the roadmap if I was building that? Project management capabilities. I couldn't put the whole thing on there. I have to explain that, you know. And so that's 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 the example you want to you want to avoid that, right? You want to avoid putting something on that is going to cause people to make to make bad decisions or communicate poorly or something like that. Yeah, make I bad mean, assumptions, it, whatever. Again, not trivial to not easy to do, and you can't always have those conversations. That's the that's just the challenging thing, but it's worth trying to not put yourself in that hole from the outset. Yeah. So, um, you know. Are we as product managers maybe like largely kind of overthinking the roadmap a little bit? I guess maybe for example, what I'm trying to kind of say here is like there's a lot of discussion about what a roadmap is or isn't amongst us as product mm -hmm. managers. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of conversation necessarily coming from stakeholders to product managers or product managers to stakeholders, but a roadmap is or isn't. Uh, although sometimes that could be a debate that occurs occasionally, but uh, is it really just a reflection of like the fact that roadmaps aren't working for us or for our stakeholders? Or is there something else maybe at play here as to why this is a maybe a constant thriving topic within yeah. this you know domain of product management that we're dealing with? I think I think there are a bunch of things that combine. One is that we're technologists, most of us, right? Even you know I didn't come from a programming background, but I'm a technologist, even so. And so we are big believers in facts and just show me the facts and I'll figure out the right answer and blah, 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 right? One of the things you learn through maturity, through learning about persuasion and influence is that facts are useless, not useless. They're, all, they're only there for supporting decisions that are made by people emotionally. You have fundamental rule of persuasion. People make decisions emotionally and they justify them rationally. And it's a rule of thumb. It's not 100% accurate, but it's very good as a rule of thumb. And so when you start to realize that, you start to think, oh, well, maybe putting all the facts onto this slide is not the best way to get my message across. And so that's, that's part of our set of realizations. The other is that there's all these historical forces that that lead us to want to put like a Gantt chart onto a slide, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these years of project management and Gantt's and, and, you know, the product management and project management, they sound a lot alike, but, and they are overlapping, but a lot of things that work in project management or seem to work for certain types of projects, we try to apply them to product management. They don't really work, but that's what executives see. I mean, the, the, the beauty of that Gantt roadmap is that it's really easy to understand. It's very clear what's happening on it. It just happens to all be wrong. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. from a beauty standpoint, from a, I'm going to, here's a message. I, here's a very clear message I can give you. It's fantastic. The only problem is there's no way to make it be actually correct and aligned with reality. If, it, if you could make that aligned with reality, I'd be totally in favor of that. That'd be fantastic. I'd love that because that would solve a lot of our problems. If you could literally go and put a Gantt chart out that said, here's the things we will be delivering in X, Y, Z timeframes. Beautiful. Yep. I just don't think we can do it. Yep. And I do, right. I do think that you need to formulate it as outcomes as opposed to features because you cannot expect your audience to be able to make the leap from the feature to the outcome. You still have to explain the outcomes typically even then, but you don't, you don't want them to have to make that leap. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe by leading into the next question really well, putting outcomes or problems on a roadmap seems like the right idea to stay out of feature listing, but stakeholders complain this doesn't tell them what the teams are going to do. How do you work around this tension? Well, again, you can't put what they're going to do on the roadmap because it's a lot it's a long list of things right um you know even simple features have multiple stories and complicated features have multiple stories over multiple sprints there's no way to capture that in a way that they can understand so i always think about 
I always think about the story I heard Joel Spolsky talked about working for Bill Gates. He was a product manager for Excel. And he said, the, as the product manager for Excel, you had to literally know every detail of what was working, being worked on when you went to present to Bill the roadmap. But you'd present the roadmap at a high level, and Bill would just, just choose one thing to drill all the way down to the bottom on. And that was his technique, right? That was seems to have been, it worked at any rate for Bill. Um, but that's that's sort of how I think about it, right? I'm going to talk about the outcomes that we're delivering. If you want to know details about that, you can ask me and we can have a conversation about that. Or I can have another slide that drills down on that or another slide that drills down on that. But I'm not going to put all that, I can't put all that detail on the roadmap, but I'm happy to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's not just going to be a conversation about what we're building, but why we chose to, how we prioritized it, what the inputs were, what the evidence we have is, how we've tested our solution, how we validated it's going to work, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Well, I'm, I'm going to hope it is. If not, we'll, we'll probably see some follow-up on that side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe another question here. The level of frustration for stakeholders and investors for now, next, later roadmaps uh, is definitely a sort of a perilous place uh, when other de- uh, when every other department in the company is date-driven. And there are product and engineering externalities that are date-driven as well. Um, how do you make sure teams are accurately sizing various different things, how do you essentially provide that set, you know, properly unbounded, unconstrained product dev team <laughs> kind of view, essentially manage all that scope creep? So it's a pretty big question, but that's a big, that's like every single yeah. thing that can go yeah. wrong. Um, yeah. It's, it's so good question. And a lot of this is your persuasive persuasion abilities is, is actually, this is what it calls, also calls into, calls into play. So let's talk about a, a couple of the things you said. Um, other departments are date driven. That's true. Um, but how much of how many of their dates actually really depend on product things? So a marketing launch li- does depend on product things, and that can be a risky. That's we all know that that's a risky area because we know that oh we're working on this big feature we want to launch it in June, and oh by the way June is coming and it's not done. We've all experienced that, right? So. How does the roadmap help you with that? Well, the roadmap's only about what you're doing, right? At best, it doesn't, it's not going to force you to do anything. It's not going to force your, if you made a bad design decision on that big feature, which means you can't deliver it until January, doesn't matter what the roadmap says, you know, that's just going to be a reality. And so there is, I think it's beholden on both, on all of the organizations to, be prepared for change, right? Um, you know, if you want to do a marketing launch based on a big feature, you better be really, really confident that you have that feature wired early enough that you can commit to, yes, this can be part of the launch. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, how long does it take to do a, a big marketing launch? Let's say three months for a medium-sized company, right? A, a, a medium-sized software company. Well, then you better have that feature really well understood, prototype validated, maybe halfway coded at least three months before the launch so you know you're going to have it ready maybe even i mean ideally when you launch you want to have beta customers who've used it which means i have to have delivered it three months beforehand or at least a month you know and so you know if you back it up it's like yeah we can we can release that thing yeah we're going to release that thing on may 27th so you can launch it on may on on june 1st but do you really want your, do you want to have that level of brinkmanship? Maybe not. On the other hand, the launch doesn't have to say this is available now. The launch can say, hey, this is the thing we're working on. Let me show you how it's going to be. And this will be available to you soon. Many launches go that way. I mean, even Apple launches stuff that, that way, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. and of course, even Apple has already built a million phones by the time they announce, but they still aren't available for three, three or four weeks. Or they might've built 10 million phones, who knows? Um, if you think about, you know, I, I always think about, we love to use analogies with like manufacturing companies and, and things like that. And you think about like a car company announcing the next model of their car of, you know, whatever it is. Well, first of all, it takes five years to design it, to build an, a new, fully new design of a car. Typically, most launches are actually the 
the slight Chrome changes on the next version of the existing model, right? So that's a relatively easy to say, and they've done it for a hundred years and they actually, they do know a lot of that is very predictable for what they do. But a new, a new car model, you know, they, they announced a new, like the think about the new Corvette, right? They spent five years designing that. They started talking about it, say a year or so. I mean, there were probably leaks, but they, were, they started talking about it a year before it came out. Well, by a year before it came out, they had built a bunch of them in the final design. They would tested them. They'd crash tested them. They safety tested them. They've probably done 100,000 mile tests on that car before they even announced it. We have to think of ourselves if we're going to use manufacturing as our one of our load stars, we have to think about how they really do it in reality. You know, they don't just say, oh, we're going to build this. The next version of the Corvette's going to be fantastic and we're starting it now. It'll be available in a year. That is not what happens. Same for chips. Chips are the same way. Chip chip development is takes a set takes seven years. It used to take four. And that caused when it got longer, it caused a lot of chip roadmaps to get way out of date. Intel yeah. has delivered all of its chips. Maybe they've fixed it since, but up until a few years ago, they were delivering all their chips two years later than they had planned. Because the development process took longer than they thought. And this is a, this is stuff that obeys the laws of physics, unlike software, right? <laughs> they know, you know, the behavior. I mean, and before they even announce something, they have tested all the fundamental things and that they still can't be, make their, anyway, I could go on and on, obviously. Have I had this conversation before, Scott? Yes, I have. <laughs> um, I want to come back to your podcast. Um, you did an episode a while back, it was episode 69 in there. You talked to kind of framed up the roadmap presentation, the overall task of doing that. Um, and and you talked there that we often go to the attention of like sharing what we're working on when what we really need to do instead is consider what the audience needs to know about what we're working on, <laughs> um, which I thought was a really great framing. Um, and, and the, you know, and you talked earlier a little bit about the importance here of sharing different roadmaps depending on the audience and their kind of needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess like my, my core question underneath all of this is like, why do we get this wrong so often? Why do we show up trying to tell our, our story versus the story that other people are interested in, in hearing? Scott, I do not know the answer to that question. Oh, wow. I, I wish I did. The, okay. um, but I, as I said, when we talked earlier about being technologists, about having all this received stuff from project management about Gantt charts, and certainly, you know, the first, I think the natural inclination of anybody when they hear roadmap, and I don't, I don't exactly know where this comes from, is to do this Gantt chart with dates across the top and features on the Gantt chart. Yeah. And, um, and when I say Gantt chart, it's not technically a Gantt chart. Obviously, that's a real thing, but it's like boxes spread out on a spreadsheet over time or on a power uh, slide so that's the natural inclination i think it's you know we think particularly we, we always think we know more than we do we always think you know we have this idea that give people the facts and they'll make the they'll come to the correct conclusions um and so you know it's just all these things that combine to make it seem like oh I know that roadmaps are maybe a problem for other people, but ours is going to be fine. It's so, so some hubris involved as well. That's, yeah, what, just, that's what I would say. Combination of yeah, things. I guess what I'm trying to get out in this is I think it's interesting that we show up in a defensive posture about mm -hmm. our roadmaps, trying well, to explain our story versus maybe more of a storytelling posture, trying to, uh, convince a line influence whatever it might be on that side yeah well and that's part of you know i think in the blurb for this you mentioned that uh it was something i said and i even had a stronger statement if i can remember what it was but a lot of it is trying to convince we go into them feeling like we need to convince executives that we're not idiots and malingerers right now i think that's because a lot of executives think that we are why can they not get features out faster? Why did we not address this competitive uh, gap? Blah, 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 right? No. And the fact is that, yeah, we, we, we're doing our best. We actually are working as fast as we can, right? We can't work faster than we can. This is a whole other thing I talk about. But they've, they want to feel like 
maybe if they show me everything that's that they're working on i can then use a whip to i can crack a whip over them to make sure that they actually do that what they told us and i i think if you asked an executive they would say that's totally not what we're what we're doing but if you ask the people down below and you said does this resonate with you they would say that's how it feels right and so but you need to get yourself out of that that's an, that's an that's a bad loop to be in right and so a lot of the persuasion aspect of what you present as the roadmap is to say, persuade we're not idiots we're not malingerers here's why this is here's what we're working on here's why here's why it's taking so long you know often that's a part of the conversation um here's why we can't do this until we do this right um and so that's sort of the tension i think and you have to get above that level of fear to be effective all right cool or you have to pretend to be above that level i mean a lot <laughs> yeah. of this is an act as well right so you have to at least act like you're above that level of fear because that then gives you credibility to tell the story that you want to tell yeah yeah makes sense makes sense um, I'm going to close out with one last question here, and that's you once wrote about what your ideal product management tool would let you do for roadmaps. You said it would allow you to share it with stakeholders. You'd have public names for features and themes. You'd buffer expected dates. You'd be able to edit, annotate, or hide entries if needed. And you could put that all on a slide and have it update in real time. But ultimately, I guess if we could come back to like a better mental model for roadmaps, um, how could we change them? Yeah, well... Again, you really need to think about what the purpose is of the roadmap and what's the communication purpose, what's the persuasion purpose. And sometimes what you just described, which I wrote probably back in 2014 or so, okay. right? Um, around the time that product board was coming out and around the after Accept 360 had had died. And it was just, first of all, it just seemed to me that this is what we do as product managers, right? we make that decision about what should go on there. We articulate it in certain ways. Why do I have to do this freshly for every slide? Yep. Um, it, it seemed like a good tool. I would probably now put that as a lower priority for a lot of other things that a project man product management tool might do. But um, I feel like if you put yourself, if you, if you make your, come from the standpoint of what does this audience need? What can I help them understand? How can I make their life better? by communicating with them and how can i show that i'm you know i think of a lot of presentation a lot of persuasion as being communicating with the audience's subconscious because the audience you think about the subcon the subconscious in a very simple model it either doesn't trust you or it trusts you and if it doesn't trust you that's really bad and if it trusts you that's really good and so a lot of what i think how i think about present persuasion and all the different components of that is is this thing going to make the audience so the audience's subconscious trust me or distrust me and so that's you want to do the things that are going to make it more trustworthy in it and there's an aspect of over time as well again the the beauty of that gantt chart simple gantt chart roadmap that has dates is the audience will trust you at that moment but then they will immediately be disappointed and they will no longer trust you later. It's like if you feed them a beautiful meal and they get food poisoning, it's like you don't go back to that restaurant, right? <laughs> That's the same thing. That's the danger of presenting the thing that they want to see because it's going to give them food poisoning and they'll never come back to that restaurant. They'll never trust that restaurant again. So instead, you have to, first of all, make sure you don't give them food poisoning, right? And what's the, me so the metaphor is rapidly getting out of hand here, but basically it means don't tell them something that immediately starts to become false that's 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 essentially food poisoning in this context um but it still has to make them feel good right and of course restaurants have figured out how to do, how to not give you food poisoning we have to figure out the equivalent in product management um even if it's not you know that beautiful i don't i don't know I, the metaphor died in my brain <laughs> it's okay i thought it was a good good a, a good metaphor in some ways so restaurants are really restaurants are fantastic metaphors for product management there's so many great things you 
if you think about it from a restaurant standpoint, you can say, oh, I can see where I'm going wrong from the product management standpoint. Yeah, that's I awesome. Love, I love that metaphor. That's awesome. In fact, I have thanks a podcast episode about that. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing and uh, being part of this today. I know it's a lot of questions coming at you, a lot of different things to think about on the spot, um, but I appreciate you sharing your 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 experiences and, and some of your knowledge on that side. Um, with that in mind, uh, we're going to wrap things up, I think, here uh, as we're coming into the top of the hour. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback on today's session. So I have shared a link inside the chat if you want to take a moment to uh, click on that. We'd love to get your thoughts and feedback, uh, and we'll definitely share that with Nils. And you could also win one of our prizes. Um, and if you do want to continue the conversation on this, on anything roadmaps or anything related to roadmaps, we'd love to have you uh, start a conversation or discussion inside our community on that side. Um, if you want to continue to grow your product craft, we have lots of different things going on inside our community, including a lot of different upcoming events. Uh, Connie Kwan's joining us next week to talk about telling your roadmap story. Uh, that should be an exciting event here. Again, helping people kind of communicate more effectively about their plans and their roadmaps. We have JJ Rory coming in on the 22nd. This is a Tuesday, not one of our Thursday events. Uh, talking about the five immutable truths of great product managers. Daniel Merriman's joining us to talk a little bit about roadmaps and the whole discomfort part of this part. Um, Bruce McCarthy, who wrote uh, Product Roadmaps Relaunched, is going to come in and talk about using our roadmaps to drive stakeholder alignment. And then we'll be wrapping up the year as well with Pavel Samanoff, who's going to be talking about hypothesis-driven product development. Uh, if you do want to get involved and, and talk a little bit, uh, we're definitely always looking for speakers. People are interested in sharing their perspectives on their work. Feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to have you involved on that side. And with that, we're going to wrap up. Say thank you, Nils, again for everything. I really, really appreciate it. Good to catch up and chat a little bit more about these things. And great to get you on stage here with us. It was my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Scott.